this is a ridiculous pile of books. Who in their right mind thinks they can read this amount of material in a week? Well, this is a clear sign of self-delusion. It's a rainy afternoon here before the long weekend. Lots of rain, lots of cars. And I thought I'd film a little bit of a um, kind of a combo Friday reads maybe TBR-ish kind of video. Hopefully short. Uh, March has been, a, um, how would I say, a middling reading month for me. I've read lots, most of which hasn't stuck with me. It's been a particularly busy and intense time at work. It's close of the fiscal year and in academic libraries that often means um, lots of scrambling to spend out budgets to make sure every every penny you have um, that you spend and that you spend it on um, things that are important to the university community so that takes a huge amount of effort and in our particular case we have two very different financial accounting systems we have to make work together and that that's um, ate a lot of my brain the last week two weeks three weeks four weeks I guess since January it's been eating my brain if I'm truthful with myself. So since end of year spending and accounting ate most of my brain in March, I did a bunch of simple pleasure reading and uncharacteristically that meant a stack of romance novels. So I read a stack of by Julia Quinn in the Bridgerton series and a stack of Courtney Milan in her brother's series, I think it was called, and perfectly competent um, historical romances um, which I appreciated for their ability to, to just take my mind out of my mind um, so that I didn't have to spend too much time thinking about the exchange rate and taxes, accruals and all of that. So in March I also finished up some of the reading I was doing for Black History Month. I finished James Baldwin's Another Country which has to be one of the best novels I've read this year so far. I am um, I'm a huge admirer of Baldwin's writing, particularly his essays. I think he has a very fine writing style and a compelling vision and an ability to draw a character in place that, that's just masterful. So I very much enjoyed that. I also read something by Jesse Fawcett called, let me check here so I get it right, There Is Confusion. So the novel that was written at the beginning of the Harlem Renaissance in the early 1920s um, by Jesse Fawcett, and this is uh, was less successful as a reading experience for me, but still a, a competent novel about urban life in the 1920s and 30s in Harlem. Um, it's an interesting contrast, I think, to Anne Petrie's The Street, which I read in February, which I think is actually a much finer novel. So The Fawcett, I think, is worth reading if you are interested in the Harlem Renaissance, but want to read outside um, the stack of familiar names, people like Nella Larson or Langston Hughes and that kind of thing. It's a competent novel, but nowhere nearly as fine as James Baldwin. Who could match James Baldwin, really? Um, what else? I'm looking over here at my list of things I read. The other novel that's left me th thinking a lot about it is Annabelle Lyons' Consent. It's a slim, slim volume. Um, quick read story of the intersecting lives of two, um, of two pairs of sisters. To talk about it in any detail was to give away a lot of the plot and it's quite a plotty book in some ways um, and it's quite finely structured and, and the relationships amongst all the characters are really well drawn and I think it's something I'm going to go back to and reread. Um, the cover in Canada is a, kind of a very innocuous pink color cover with a glass upside down and only when you look at it really closely can you see that there's something slightly off in the cover. There's a, the, the wine glass has a, a lipstick stain on it and, and I think some kind of arachnid under the glass and it's a quite a good cover for um, articulating some of the the kinds of relationships and themes in the novel. Um, if you're a fan of um, 
perfumes as a way of um, self-expression. I think you'd particularly like this book. I'm not a perfume person myself, but I think if you were, you'd probably enjoy this. It's an odd recommendation, I know, but it's one of the things that Lion is using to um, characterize the women in her novel. Um, what else? Let's see, a stack of things here. Oh, my book to spin. This is John Glasgow's The Memoirs of Montparnasse. And this is a copy I've had since, uh, let's see, a friend of mine gave it to me in 1980, so it was her copy. So it's got, you know, a rather odd inscription in it and lots of little scribbly reading notes. Glasgow presents this as a, a, a memoir he wrote in the 1920s when he was in Paris between 28 and early 1930. but. That's a kind of a tissue of lies. He wrote it in the late 60s when there was a boom in expatriate memoirs. Um, people telling their, their story of what it was like to be bright young things in Paris and then before the crash. And I quite enjoyed this. It, it's as frivolous and well-written and funny and sharp and snide as I remember it. What I didn't remember, and it's is mostly a reflection of who I was that many decades ago, is the, the kind of ugly racial stuff that creeps into the novel, um, memoir, not quite a novel, the ugly racial stuff that creeps in um, in the last oh, 20 or 30 pages where racial descriptions of the black Americans in Paris at the time are um, most charitably described as ham-handed and um, probably more accurately as a reflection of Glasgow's racism. But if you're interested in the 1920s and you like memoirs that are partly Romana Clough, partly actual memoir, um, you might enjoy John Glasgow. I thoroughly enjoyed that reread. Um, I would recommend it, but warn you about the um, cack-handed racism in the last 20 or 30 pages. What else do I have here? Most of my books this month came from the library, so I don't have them to hand. What else is notable? Oh, I read Mary Lawson's most recent novel, A Town Called Solace. So Lawson's novel tells the story of the sister of a young woman who's just disappeared, a middle-aged man who's come to Solace to live in a house he's just inherited, and the story of the elderly woman he's inherited the home from. Um, the, the stories are told in alternating points of view and they all interconnect at the end. And it's a, a good novel. It's not a spectacular novel, but I enjoyed it. It's very um, even-tempered and I think in many ways kind-hearted novel, but it's also a novel that's set in the 1970s. Um, so it's got a very kind of narrow historical frame of reference, but a pleasant enough read. Um, I don't think I can think of a comparator right off the top of my head, but that was worth having read, I think. Not nearly as good as um, Annabelle Lyons' Consent, though, if you were going to choose between two recent releases coming out of Canada, I would choose Consent over Town Name Solace. I'm just looking at the rest of the list here. Uh, everything else is just kind of middling and I'm gonna pass right over it and I'm gonna definitely pass over the stuff that I thought wasn't very good even though it might have been hyped a lot in the uh, book chats here and there. So this week coming up I have four days off in a row. Four days in a row. <laughs> And I'm hoping to get a fair amount of reading done, some pleasure, mostly pleasure reading and some reading that's linked to my research. So one of the things I'm hoping to finish over this next four day, gloriously free from work span, is this. Our Bodies, Their Battlefields, War Through the Lives of Women by Christina Lamb. It's got a particularly classy bookmark in it. A clean Kleenex. That's all I had to hand. Uh, this is a, um, a journalistic account of the role that rape and sexual terrorism play in war. 
focuses primarily on women, and I'm finding this actually quite uh, a frustrating book to read. I mean, it's very difficult to read. I mean, it's unending accounts of horrific um, sexual violence on women and, and girls, and very young women and girls, too, um, all over the world. I'm going as far back as so far I've read into the 40s during World War II. Uh, what I'm finding frustrating about it is that it's structurally incoherent. There's no logic that I can see so far leading you from chapter to chapter. It's a very journalistic book um, that is, is told without very much historical grounding, oddly enough, for a book that is positioning itself as a history. There's not much in terms of um, looking at the, the causes of rape and sexual violence. There's not much linking it to previous work done on sexual violence. Um, and the tone sometimes is off. Um, the adjective used to describe women, and particularly the women's clothing, is just off. Um, a Yazdi woman is described as wearing a pu puritanical dress, which is just tone deaf, um, culturally wrong, and probably the adjective Lamb needed was modest. Um, so I think it needed a better editor, and uh, though the content is compelling, the writing's not particularly good, and the structure makes no sense at all, and it really needs. Um, for my taste and preferences, a better grounding in um, empirical research and history, which it doesn't have. So I'm going to finish it because I think they're important stories to hear, but disappointing. Let's see what else I have from the library. Square Haunting by Francesca Wade, I believe. Yes, Francesca Wade. This one has a respectable bookmark, actual bookmark. Uh, this is the story of four or five, five women living around Mecklenburg Square in Bloomsbury from the early 1910s to about 1945-47. And I'm just partway through this and I'm really quite enjoying it. Um, I'm at this point reading the section about Hilda Doolittle, HD, and beginning to wonder what happened to my copy of HD's poetry. So this one I think I'm going to look forward to finishing up over the next three or four days. Got, um, History and Practice by Ludmila Jordanova. Is that how I say? Yes, Jordanova. It's a, um, a description of how the discipline of history is the discipline of history, and I'm reading it to give me a better foundation under some of the research I'm doing. I'm not trained as a historian. I'm trained as a literary scholar and then subsequently as a librarian and I'm in the midst of writing a number of um, things on library history and the history of um, reading and I need to give myself a little more solid foundation so that's something I'm going to make my way through in the next week or so and it's been sitting on my you should read this shelf for about a year so time to get to it. What else? In addition to that stack of non-fiction I'm going to tackle this weekend, I'm going to uh, read, I hope, Christiane Conlon's latest novel, The Speed of Mercy. I just got it from the library in e-format, so I'm very much looking forward to that. I enjoyed her first novel, Heave, a great deal. It's a story of a um, 16 to 18 year old pair of friends and how their lives kind of unspool over the course of one summer. I uh, didn't care so much for her second novel, which is called The Memento. I had trouble um, with its deviation from the kind of historical and physical reality of the place that she was describing. So I had difficulty suspending disbelief in the way she was describing um, the Fundy Coast. And I didn't get on with her collection of short stories, what's its title? Watermark. Nothing wrong with the short stories, they're fine. It's just I don't like short stories very much but her novel, I'm quite interested in seeing what she's done this time. I have a small stack of other things that I'll probably dip into as the mood takes me. I've got two things associated with Ozzy April, one of which is this. This is Tia Astley's It's Raining in Mango, the story of a farming family in Australia, a white family. 
I've had this for years and I've never read it. I've held on to it because it was a gift from a friend and because it's got an inscription. And I wasn't ready to let it go yet, so I think it's time to read it. The other one is a book I studied in school, in graduate school, a very long time ago, um, and struggled with it then. This is Christina Stead's The Man Who Loved Children. I'm, I wanted to see what it's going to be like to reread this. Um, I had such an interesting and positive experience in rereading Glasgow, a book that I did enjoy when I first read it as an undergraduate, that I thought I'd try for Aussie April what it's like to reread this one, which I struggled with for all kinds of reasons um, in my mid 20s or yeah, late 20s. I think I read this one in my late 20s. So I thought I might dip into that one. We shall see though. It's kind of a chonker. And it's, you know, the spine's probably going to break as I read it. That's not no big deal, but. That's probably what's going to happen, uh, depending on my mood and how quickly all the other reading goes. You never know, sometimes stuff goes really quickly, sometimes not so much. I might dip into this. This is The Bone People, Carrie Hume's Booker Prize winning novel. Carrie Hume is a New Zealander, Maori. Um, I read this in my late 20s, probably shortly after I came out um, as the Booker winner. And I remember enjoying its portrayal of um, New Zealand culture and the consequences of trauma and child abuse at the time, but also I was aware that I didn't really understand what was going on. So I'm thinking that it will be interesting to reread this and all that I, I understood large chunks of, missed large chunks of the cultural context, but enjoyed in contrast with this one novel where I did understand most of the cultural context, I think, but didn't enjoy to see what those two rereading experiences might be like. And the last book on the pile of possibilities would be this, After Dolores by Sarah Schulman. This is a, a lesbian novel set in the mid-80s in the Lower East Side. Um, I've dipped into this but haven't made much headway. It's the story of Dolores, of um, the main character after her girlfriend Dolores has left her, kind of flailing about that happens after the end of a, a relationship, a particularly intense relationship. So that's my overly ambitious stack of books for the beginning of April and a little bit about what the standouts from March were. Who knows how much reading I'll actually get to do. It's supposed to be raining for the next seven to ten days here, and that usually means sitting around and reading, in addition to maybe getting, making a little bit of headway on some of my research, which I'm very much looking forward to. I hope you have had a good reading week, and that you have as much downtime as you need over the next week or so, and that you find good books to read. Bye-bye!